.NET 9 is introducing a whole lot of new functionality. There's work on improving performance, making us as developers a little bit more productive, changes to system.text.json, the time span, deprecating the binary formatter, and I guess most important of all, there's a lot of improvements to C Sharp as a programming language. Let's take a look at what's new in .NET 9 and C Sharp 13. My name is Philip Eckberg, and I'll be happy to guide you through a couple of the latest improvements to .NET and C Sharp. Updates to .NET generally means there's updates to the SDK, the runtime, ASP.NET Core, which includes Blazor, updates to .NET MAUI, performance, security improvements, as well as updates to C Sharp. In terms of updating ASP.NET Core, there's improvements that have been made to OpenAPI. These improvements to OpenAPI will replace that older swashbuckle ASP.NET Core. This will let you expose information about your APIs, making it easier for a consumer to understand exactly how to interact with your API. There's been improvements to Signal R in terms of trimming and native AOT. You can now use the new internal server error typed error. I'm not exactly sure if you'd really want to face an internal server error out to your consumers, but if you want to, there's now a typed error to allow you to do that. One of the important updates to ASP.NET Core 9 is in terms of authorization and authentication. If you've used Identity Server or any other authorization servers, you might have heard about a pushed authorization request. This is an addition to using OAuth and OpenID Connect. It introduces an extra layer of security to avoid the request being tampered with so that instead of requesting the browser to immediately redirect to the authorization server, instead, your backend will first produce a POST request to the authorization server with the given redirect URI, the client ID, and the scopes required for you to perform that authorization. Then, after that's been performed, it will then tell the browser to redirect to a URI. This will then, for example, hide the scope from the browser and also hide any other potential PII information that could be a part of that authorization request. This avoids tampering and is a little bit of a more secure approach. There's also the addition of allowing us to use keyed DI in middlewares. Keyed DI was introduced in a previous version of .NET. Now we can also use that if we are setting up our own custom middlewares. I guess last but not least, we also have a new concept called a hybrid cache. The hybrid cache is meant to be able to simply replace an in-memory cache or a distributed cache. Just right out of the box. You can go ahead and update to .NET 9 and replace every usage of an in-memory cache or the distributed cache and use the hybrid cache instead. So why would this be a better approach? The hybrid cache will in fact store your cached item both in memory as well as in a distributed cache, if one has been configured. For example, let's say that you're caching some important and potentially expensive information. Then we could first check if that has been stored already in memory. If it hasn't, we can go ahead and check if it's stored in the distributed cache. That could, for example, be a Redis cache, living somewhere else. Now, if it hasn't been stored in the Redis cache, we can go ahead and load the item, which again could be potentially expensive. Once that has been loaded into the application, it can then be stored in memory as well as in the distributed cache. They could have separate expiries so that your distributed cache lives a little bit longer than the in-memory cache. This would allow you to have restart capability of your applications on the local server be it a distributed application, and then if it's then removed from memory, it could then go ahead and grab that information from the distributed cache. This is a great addition to ASP.NET Core, something that I hope that a lot of developers will in fact leverage. And of course, as always, the updates to .NET in general, the runtime and the SDK, all of that is also applicable in ASP.NET Core. There's more stuff added to ASP.NET Core, Blazor is a huge portion of ASP.NET Core, but we'll save that for a potential later video. ASP.NET Core also introduces the concept of map static assets. This is a new way of mapping your static files. 
This will, in a more efficient manner, allow you to serve static files to the end user. It will allow you to use the e-tag so that the browser knows if the content has actually changed. You can simply replace the current version of mapping static files with this new mapped static assets. One of the problems I've seen developers run into is when they apply the allow anonymous attribute on one of their controllers, or if they're inheriting from a controller where they added the allow anonymous on that base controller. Then they'd like one of the actions inside of this controller to require authorization. However, this doesn't work, as the allow anonymous takes precedence over the authorized attribute. Now with .NET 9, this will in fact produce a warning. And I guess all of us are always looking at our warnings and attending to those to make sure that our applications are free of faults. If we aren't, we should probably go ahead and check all the warnings and potentially turn them into errors. Another really big portion of .NET is .NET Aspire. And this has also been updated with .NET 9. .NET Aspire allows us to improve the workflow when building applications. It sets up a really nice dashboard where we can connect our different applications together. It produces service discovery so that our different types of applications can figure out where to find the other ones and use those dependencies very easily from within those different applications. The updates to .NET Aspire gives us persistent containers so that the containers that could potentially be expensive to set up can be running in the background. It knows if that container has already been started, for example, if it's running in Docker, and then it doesn't have to create that again. It supports custom commands so that we can say that we have a command for a particular application, for example, to clear all stuff that we have in the database. We can very easily append one of these custom commands and add them to one of our different services. It also has really great health checks. It allows us to use Azure Functions. And overall, it gives us a much better experience. Personally, I've added .NET Aspire to a couple of projects, and this has greatly improved my workflow when building the applications locally. And of course, there's also going to be a lot of updates to Blazor and .NET MAUI. I work a lot with mobile development using .NET MAUI. And frankly, with the latest versions of .NET, this has become a really great experience. There was a couple of hiccups along the way, but with the latest versions, there's less bugs, there's support for more things in terms of using APIs that are available on the native platforms, and the developer experience has become a little bit better as well. Before looking at the changes to C Sharp 13, let's look at the shared functionality that's been introduced and improved in all different types of applications. I'm talking about the SDK and runtime improvements. The first thing that's been improved is working with base64 URL encoded data. So let's say that we have a string of data coming into the application, and we're retrieving that as UTF-8 bytes. Now, I'd like to convert this into a base64 URL, and traditionally, you call the convert.toBase64 string, and then you'd have to also URL encode this, which required a little bit of extra allocations and processing power, which is a little bit unnecessary. So there's an improvement by introducing a type called base64 URL. This allows you to immediately encode to a string and decode that data as well. You might note that spans greatly improve the performance of the applications and our algorithms if used correctly. Although there has been some limiting factors as to how we can use this with types where we can implicitly convert to different types. For example, I know that a string can be implicitly converted into a read-only span of a character, which makes sense because the span is really just pointers to the start and an end of a collection of things, and a string is really just a collection of characters. If I have a dictionary of a string of a string, meaning a cache of objects, for example, given that everyone wants to write high-performance applications, a lot of developers are now using the read-only span. That means that I might get a read-only span of a character, but to use that as a key for my dictionary, I'd have to first convert that back into a string. And that means extra allocations, which then means a potentially slower application as well. It would be better if I could simply create an alternative lookup 
to say that I'm going to use my dictionary of a string of a string to get an alternative lookup where the key will be a read-only span of a character. It will then know exactly how to use that together with the already existing key. I can then, through this lookup, find the appropriate key in my dictionary without having to convert that into a new string, which reduces the amount of allocations. There is also the concept of a feature switch. You might have used feature switches in other types of applications where you dynamically turn off or turn on features in the application depending on where that is running. In .NET, there is now a default way of providing this. We can say that we have a feature switch enabled or disabled by setting some information in our CS project file. We can turn on or turn off this by simply changing the value in our project definition by simply changing that value in the project file. The reason this is important is because we can also determine if we want the code to be trimmed off when we are publishing the application, meaning that we can reduce the file size and not publish code that shouldn't and not publish code that shouldn't be in that final binary. This is particularly important for ahead of time compilation where we want to have really small application binaries. And of course, as with the other previous versions of .NET, there's improvements to using system.text.json. We can set the indentation option to determine how we'd like our JSON to be indented when we are serializing this. If we're using the ASP.NET Core defaults, that means no whitespace at all. There's now a way for us to use the default behavior that we also get in ASP.NET Core. We can also use something called a JSON schema exporter to get the open API definition for a particular type. This is what's used internally when producing the open API information for our APIs. Hopefully, everyone at this point is using the nullable reference types. We can now set an option for our JSON serializer to respect the nullable annotation. And what this means is that it will ensure that the JSON document that we are deserializing is in fact setting the appropriate values. So if you are in fact passing null or not setting a property at all, and it is determined to be non-nullable, then the JSON serializer will throw an exception. However, if you are working with generic types, this will work a little bit differently. It won't actually respect the nullable annotation at all, unless you explicitly determine that your generic type is of a reference type. Then the nullable annotations will be respected. We can also determine that we'd like to respect the constructor parameters. By default, the deserializer will set the strings in this case to the default values if they are not available in our JSON document. However, I'd like to respect that they are required, so if they're not available in the JSON document, again, I'd like to throw an exception. And in terms of working with the spans, there's even more changes and improvements to how we can work more efficiently with using the spans in .NET. There's now going to be many more methods available in .NET that will allow you to pass in read-only spans of characters or other spans of T as well. One example of this is using the file helpers. I could say that I'd like to write all text through the file class to a specific file. In the previous versions of .NET, you'd have to, again, convert this data into a new string before passing it into write all text, which again then requires more allocations, which is a little bit unnecessary. With this overload, we can now more efficiently write that data to the disk without having to copy any more memory to a new memory location. One of these extension methods is starts with and ends with. We could check if our read-only span of a character starts with a given string. We could also find a particular pattern in a read-only span of a byte. And we can also use this to split a string of information as well and do that in a very memory efficient manner. There's a lot of more potentials using these extension methods. And personally, this is a couple of things that I've missed when working with the spans of T. I've had to re-implement all of this myself, which hasn't really been that difficult, but having it as a part of .NET makes a lot of sense. And in terms of using that split functionality, if we take a look at this string of information here, which is a comma-separated text, 
I'd like to split all the different ranges into separate portions. I'm going to take my input, which is a span, and split that by a specific separator, which in this case is a comma. That means that it will take the first letter up until it finds that comma, and that's one range in my text. Then it will give me the second range as well, so I can work with that information. And why is this important? Because now I can use this range to slice off the portion that I like to work with. This is a zero allocation effort to split a string into multiple different portions, which again is a lot more memory efficient and also CPU efficient. We don't have to copy any more memory over. That's it for the functionality in ASP.NET Core, the improvements to .NET in general. Let's now talk about C Sharp 13. C Sharp 13 introduces a new field keyword so that if you have an auto property and you'd like to clean up the data before you return that back to the user or before you set the value, you can reference the backing field. However, this introduces a breaking change. Because if you already have a field available in the class called field and you reference that in one of your properties, then this new contextual keyword will change its meaning. So you'd have to use the keyword escaping character to be able to reference that old field in the class. Again, if you check the warnings in your applications after upgrading to .NET 9 and you recompile the application with C Sharp 13, which will then be the default, then you will get a warning that you have an unused variable in the class. That's one way to spot this as well. There's a new lock object in semantics, which will use a new API that more efficiently allow us to use a lock. It will instead use this new API in favor of that old monitoring API. We can use params with collections, which is a really important and interesting language feature. So if we have a lot of overloads where we have params in front of the different spans, read-only spans, all the different enumerables, this will allow us to more efficiently work with our different data types. It will avoid implicit conversions. If we have a params of span, it will take precedence over a params of array. And for implicit conversions, it will use a value parameter. We can use this here in multiple different ways. We can say that I'd like to pass one element at a time, or I'd like to pass an entire collection, potentially produced by a collection expression. And what's interesting when there's an ambiguity, if we have two different overloads and the compiler cannot determine which one is the more appropriate one, we can use another new language feature called overload resolution priority. The overload resolution priority is simply an attribute that we append on the different methods to say which one we'd like to take precedence when there's an ambiguity. In this case here, I can say that I'd like to use the span of t instead of the list of t, as I know that the implementation is a little bit more efficient. And for the final two language features that have been introduced, we have partials or improvements to partials. We've always been able to do partial classes and partial methods, or not always, but for a very long time. Now we can also do partial properties. This is great for source generation. Finally, we have something called implicit index access. I could reference the last element of an array using the hat symbol and set that to a particular value and doing so when I'm using the object initializer to create my object. With all of that being said, I've covered pretty much everything that I find important with the release of .NET 9, ASP.NET Core 9, and C Sharp 13. There's lots more to cover in terms of using Blazor and using .NET MAUI, but that would potentially have to be videos for some time in the future, if that's of interest. With that being said, I hope you're excited about checking out some of these language features and the .NET improvements on your own. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And please feel free to like the video and subscribe to my channel, and I'll try to add more types of videos like this in the future. Again, my name is Philip Eckberg, and thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video.